I like to leap at the end of the day, but I will actually have things to say about the investment models that you might want to think about, as well as the technology pieces. So, uh, my 30 year career, 35 years, has been in mines, underground mines in Sudbury, uh, plus mines all around the world. The deep mines in Sudbury are now 8,000 feet below surface. Just to give you a taste of what that's like in terms of a high rise building, it's about 650 to 700 stories high. You don't have buildings like that in cities. And these blocks that we've excavated are two to three city blocks long and one to two city blocks deep. 650 stories high. So that's the scale of basement or mines that we use in Ontario and other parts of the world too. You can see there, we're there to reduce geotechnical risk. It's always a legacy for us. We're actually now the second safest sector in the Canadian economy. The only place you're safer in than in underground mines in Ontario is in the school system. You're actually safer as an employee in our underground mines than you are as an employee in a hospital. Just the same. Decreased capital demand, improved productivity, of course, and environmental impact. Uh, is that going to come up? Why does it not come up? It comes up in one place, but not the other. There we go. There we go. Five areas of exploration. We're not going to touch on that. Deep mines, that's why they're deep. Uh, the problems are high rock sources and high temperature, integrated mine productivity stuff, has ROC, ROI, come back to that. And underground mine construction means getting to deep work and developing the mines into production first, that's net housing value. Those are the numbers we need to know. And we have a new program just starting now, mine productivity below 2.5 kilometers, 8,000 feet. And that's a $46 million program. Uh, $15 million of that support came from the feds. A lot of bureaucracy, but well worth the 15 million, thank you. And the other 15 million came from, not from the big mining companies, and this is the investment piece, from the small to medium sized enterprises that service and uh, supply the big mining companies. There's a lot of contraction in investment from the big mining companies, and that's entirely being taken up by the SME community. So that 15 million dollars two years ago, this year we just completed a new application with a different program, and we managed to raise $65 million, 100% of which came from the service and supply sector. So if you think about having been to space, used all the gizmos that you want in space, and bring them back and find an application for them on the planet, perhaps the source of investment is to find the people who will use them on Earth at the same time as you're developing it for space. And you can do the deal with them to co-produce the, the gizmos that you need simultaneously. Not wait till you come back to Earth to use them, just do it simultaneously. And you'll find there are people out there who want to help you do that because they can see how to expand their business on planet Earth. I'm a mining guy and fixed on planet Earth. Not going anywhere else. Just to make a difference between innovation and research, of course, it's very, very clear. Research has technical outcomes, innovation has commercial outcomes. If innovation doesn't make it into routine production on a daily basis, innovation didn't happen. That means you have to take care of all the business decisions. So for us, we're the center for excellence in mining innovation, not the center of excellence. So the excellence is not inside the center. Our job is to get the excellence executed in practice on a daily basis. And that's innovation, not research. So we sit in that space here, I'll move on from that. We sit in that space there. The new program is the Ultra Deep Mining Network, and that's anything below 8,000 feet. There's nowhere else for us to go for underground mining but below 8,000 feet. So in the big block caves, our mines in Sudbury produce 5,000 tons per day. That means we need to blast another 5,000 tons, tons tomorrow in the large block caves for copper mines in the US or in Chile. Those mines produce 100 to 150,000 tons per day. That means they need to blast another 100,000 to 150,000 tons tomorrow to produce the copper that's required by the planet. It's an issue of scale. It's not that we can't get minerals from elsewhere. Can we get them sufficient scale to make the system work? And for me, the only place to get them is from this part. Not other ones. That's our IPO piece, and those are the guys in my company who have connected to the service and supply sector, where the large numbers of funding that we're getting dollars are coming from now, not from the previous piece. And our colleagues in the research field sit at that end of the spectrum, and they do the research piece. We don't see ourselves being the researchers, they're the academic research, practical research people. We take that research product 
and it's our job to get it into the marketplace. If there is no pathway to the marketplace, we don't fund the research in the first place. Because there's no reason to do it. It's purely academic, and there's insert and, and various other government funding models for that work. If there's no pathway to commercialization, we're done. We need to move on to something else. And of course, you all understand core innovation, adjacent innovation, disruptive. So what we're talking about is research and development. We've changed that to research and demonstration model, which is really uh, uh, pilot scale. Implementation is operational scale, and then commercialization. We'll stay mostly in the core innovation and adjacent innovation zones. Here's the difference. Most people we work with, and I used to be one myself, are into research and development. They actually want to do and solve the technical problems. The next thing is implementation. That's the operational piece. And that's where you have to deal with the really awkward people who actually want to make the thing work, or sometimes want to make sure that it does work, because there's those people in operations too, and you have to solve all of those issues. And the most difficult one of all is, and that, for that green piece, you still need technical people. The problem is this piece at the bottom of the page, and it will not get into the marketplace if these business commercial issues are not addressed. And most of the technical people in the blue box wouldn't want to touch the ground box with a 10 foot pole. Most academics are academics so they can avoid working in the business world. That's why they're there. So you absolutely do not want to take your research technocrats and try and persuade them to help you to do the marketing piece because you've lost in space already. No way to get out of that box. And secondly, today I'll take that same piece, our objective in semi is to double or triple performance. Not 10% better, not 20% better, not 50% better, double or triple. Because by the time I add on all the other parts of the activities that I didn't change this month, that number is diluted down. If I have a five component process, and I double the performance in one part, I have to dilute that much, four pieces I didn't change. That means take, take double and divide it by five takes me back down to 40%, 20%, small number. So if you only aim for 10%, you're not going to get any more benefit than 10% benefit. That was your target. And the thing is, they'll loop that down by all the things you didn't change, you've made hardly any progress. So continuous improvement is kind of like inflation. It's operational inflation. Inflation is eroding your productivity all the time, and you need to make big step up gains in order to make any real progress at all. So back to that piece, that's where we are, 4.6. And we'll talk about just move that. And we do have this human health and effectiveness piece because I'm one of these curious guys that believes we're not actually going to have full 100% of uh, teleoperation or remote operations under them. It's an alien environment. How alien is it? I should have some pictures on that, but I don't. Oh, oh there. I like those big pictures. So there's two things that affect this underground, I'll go back to it in a minute. That's why I had the pictures of the, the drain conditions that we are. So, 8,000 feet below surface, we produce two to 3,000 seismic events a day. Some of them are damaging. And so <coughs> when the rock is coming off the wall at 3.5 meters per second, uh, it's best not to be there, because that's just a really bad place to be. So, we don't just have the heat issue, and our problem, just like space, is where do we get rid of the heat? We have 100% humidity, we have 40 degrees centigrade, we're trying to keep it lower than that, 38, 37, 35, with ventilation. That means using ventilation plans at a huge cost. As we go below 8,000 feet, we can no longer use the natural heat exchange techniques that we've used up until now. In Canada, because we have very cold winters, we can create a heat sink by sucking the ventilation through piles of rock in an open pits through the winter time. Creates a heat sink. And we can use that heat sink to cool the air two or three degrees through the summer. The problem is the air heats up as we push it down through hot compression, and just because of the depth of the rock. And there's a neutral point where you can no longer push cool air down and have it arrive cool at the place where you want it. That number is 8,000 feet. So we now can no longer rely on our natural heat exchange systems to cool the air. We have to do something else. And there's two ways to do that. One is to cool the air with chillers. Some gold mines in, in Quebec have already introduced uh, chillers. And those chillers, they already know one of them. It will put the mine out of business. This is a small vein gold mine. It will put 
they will put them out of business when they get to 3.1 kilometers below surface. It's just a simple um, calculation on the cost of electricity. So you can't do that. We've actually gone back 100 years, and this is maybe another piece of something to think about. It's going back to old technology. This is a 100 year old technology. It's going to produce compressed air for us. Almost, well, there's no moving parts whatsoever. We've actually added a few things to disconnect it from the little waterfall that used to be there. But essentially, it was bypassing that little waterfall. And it produced, because it's, the shaft is supposed to be high, it produced nine bar compressed air. If I take that nine bar compressed air to a dead end heading in a, in a blind end tunnel, I expand that air, I get ninefold expansion of the air, I get chilling because I get the diamagic expansion of the compressed air, and I don't have to go to the ninefold expansion of the air, I don't need to use the fans to pull the air out of there because it will happen just by expansion. And I also reduce the humidity because it's compressed air. That is free. We reckon that the actual cost of that compressed air is less than 10% of the cost of producing compressor air today. It was invented in 1910. Uh, first ones were installed in the late 1800s. We go back to 1910 and for that kind of technology. Simple, robust, not fancy, but very, very effective for our need for cooling and reducing humidity and humidity. So when you're going somewhere very, very remote, it's useful to have technology that you can fix on the fly. The more complicated it gets, the less likely you are to be able to fix it. Just saying. This is what we look like. I don't know why that one doesn't come up. There we are. So that's what we look like underground today. That's what we've looked like underground for the last 50 years or so. We've added earmuffs, we've added glasses, we've added uh, masks, we've added the occasional radio, etc. But essentially it's a hard hat, coveralls, and boots. And even with that level of technology, it's still the second safest sector of the Canadian economy. However, Things are getting tough. The rock temperatures are now greater than 50 degrees centigrade. We've got to bring that air temperature down to about, say, 5 to the 8, if we possibly can. And in dead end headings, we can't do that. And of course, the other thing is we have a demographic problem. Most of the people on the ground now are actually my age and my shape. So we're, we're not working with uh, Olympic athletes here. We're working with older guys who have particular attitudes about work life balance, i.e., there isn't any. And they're there to get things done by the end of the shift. So, at 40 degrees centigrade, and he needs to get this thing done, and he wants to get done by the end of the shift, he's going to push himself to do that. And that's not a good thing. Because although there is help if you have a heart attack and an underground mind, there is definitely help, it's definitely coming, but it will never get to where you are before you're dead. So if you have a heart attack at 8,000 feet, in any mind, anywhere on the planet, you're going to die there. Absolutely going to die. There is help, but not for you. So, because it takes us an hour and 40 minutes to get down there. This is not <laughs> the local bus stop here. Yeah. So, that's the way it is. So, within the next five to ten years, we have to look more like this than the guy in the top picture. That's just a Gemini suit. It's just the sexiest one I could find. Nobody in our industry would even credibly think about the Apollo suits. So, I went back and just found the Gemini because it looks vaguely usable to us. Our problem still, of course, is to get rid of the heat. We can definitely cool people down inside the suit, but we're still going to get rid of the heat. So in actual fact, we've moved away from these kinds of ideas in terms of how to do those things, and we're moving on to things like zeolites in the underwear, so we can actually have the humidity absorbed by the zeolites. Essentially, it's a rechargeable humidity <coughs> where we can plug it in at the end of the shift, you come back tomorrow, and the electricity has driven the zeolite, created the background again, dehydrated it, and moves it back. And you get more absorptive capacity for the next shift. So that's where we are, improving human effectiveness, because we don't believe we can do it all on the ground. Again, there are very complex processes that we can do on the ground that will take two, three, four, five minutes. Just to use an example, it's like tying your shoelaces. If you're, great, if you're no longer capable of tying your shoelaces, and if I keep going this way, I soon will no longer be able to tie my shoelaces. Building a robot to tie shoelaces is a mistake. What you really need are slip-ons. So, although we can build a robot to tie
I'm sure it is. It's not a cost-effective thing to do. We could do that. We can't actually have a slip on for some of the things we do in our process. It takes four fingers, 30 seconds or 60 seconds to do. It'll take us years to build a robot to do that. And that robot will not be able to cope with any of the other changing conditions that we have. Every day that we blast, we change the ventilation system. Every day we blast, we change the stress conditions around about the rock excavations that we have. And we will either get or not get in different places those seismic events. Over the last 20 years, we have learned to manage the stress release rates of that seismic energy in the system, and we manage it far, far better than we ever did. We can still produce Richter 4 magnitude events under them. Now, on surface, that doesn't sound very impressive, but I've got to tell you that 100 meters away, that is a seriously impressive event. It will lift you up and throw you 100 meters down the drift. It will also take your equipment do the same thing. And I've seen large scoop trams, these are large vehicles, they weigh 30 tons, crumpled like a piece of paper, move through it in the drift by these events. This is not trivial activities, it's changing all the time, and you need the intelligence that people have in their heads to be able to cope with the changes that are happening, happening in those complex environments. Robots and teleoperation simply will not do the job for us. So, just to say, these are really, really simple things. I use these slides because I'm not usually talking to the intelligentsia. I'm usually talking to other mining guys. So they need really simple pictures. So for example, there's a, a helmet with a face and it has data projection on the surface. They think this is crazy, crazy stuff. In actual fact, any kid who's in ski racing or motocross has that data available to them right now. So this is just a multi-billion dollar industry, the mining industry, not bringing in technology that exists in most Yikes. <laughs> Here is noise cancelling earphones. We, our communication technology today consists of earmuffs and standing as close to those earmuffs as possible and shouting as loud as you can <laughs> rather than using noise cancelling earphones and a sex little microphone to communicate directly with the guy you're trying to talk to. This is the limitations on culture bringing in technology into these operations. I like the one on the left, we know that's ridiculous, we can't use that anymore. But in actual fact, for most of the guys in my industry, they can understand how that would work to cool them down. In actual fact, it will not work to cool them down because of the heat and humidity conditions that are actually surrounding them. Nevertheless, the wearables, of course, five years ago when we first started talking this way, wearables were only right on the horizon, they're not completely accepted. That's why we like the wearables, because if we can intervene when somebody's about to have a heart attack, and we can call them up on their sexy microphone and noise cancelling earphones and say, please stop working now because very shortly from now you're likely to have a heart attack. We'd rather be able to do that than try and solve the problem after it's happened. And we're not doing this for fun. Oh, that's gone away. Why is it gone away? There we go. The reason is, on this planet still, we only have 24 hours. And with all of that technology, I can get four to six hours that are lost in my production schedule. I can get that four to six hours back again. On this planet, we've only got 24 to work with. So getting four to six back that are lost to production is a huge step up in performance for the whole business that we're in. So this is technology that's easily available to most of you in new businesses, not available to us in ours. There are many, many things that we are working on now that we could consume and use. So while I'm not actually in the business of saying we should go to space and do mining, what I'm saying is you're working on technologies that my industry can adopt and use, and you may actually find some of our service and supply companies as a means of funding the further development of the things that you want to develop. So this is what you hear. That's the global mining business. Since the Second World War, we have been supplying the needs of about a billion middle-class lifestyles in the left-hand bubble. That's what the global mining industry has been doing for the last 60, 70 years. Now, there's another 2 billion people in the right-hand bubble who want exactly the same lifestyle. And that means exactly the same resource demand as it does for the left-hand bubble. That's why overall this planet needs to produce three times more stuff 
of everything. Copper, iron, coal. That's not called the bottom. People think that the coal business is about burning coal for energy. It's not. The coal business is about making steel. That's what people, most people don't realize. The coal business is about making steel. It's called metallurgical coal. It's much, much more valuable, maybe five to six times more valuable than energy coal is. So even if you switched off every coal-fired power station tomorrow, you cannot switch off the coal mining business because we need it for steel. We need three times of everything, nickel, copper, chrome, everything. There's a one spot way up here, way, way up there above the lights. That's the fourth largest chromite deposit in Ontario, northern Ontario, badly named. It's now called the Ring of Fire, and there's just no way to kill that name. It's a disaster. But it is 300 miles from the nearest road. There are no power lines, <coughs> no roads, no means of access. The global mining industry is unable to, to exploit the fourth largest chromite deposit on the planet. Just to give you a picture, the biggest one is South Africa. That can't actually supply electricity 24 hours a day to all the hospitals. The second biggest deposit of chromite is in Kazakhstan, and that production, guess where, goes to China. The next one is India, and that likely goes to China too. So the fourth biggest chromite deposit on the planet, North American capitalist market systems cannot access that deposit and do it at a profit. If we can't ship chromite from Northern Ontario, into the steel mills in North America, we're not moving metals from anywhere else in the universe to here. Because it's an issue of scale and energy intensity. So that's the business we're in. For me, in the end, there's only two places to get the minerals we need. Number one is in more remote deposits on this planet, and that's difficult enough. And secondly, is in the existing mines by going deeper into more complex and difficult processes to extract the metals we need. For me, that's the only two realistic sources we have. There are really, really good reasons for going to space, but bringing back metals to the planet probably isn't one of them. But I think you'll find the mining industry is quite a fruitful place for you to find allies in developing the kinds of technologies that you need to exploit the environment that you want to go in and the one that we have to go into. So, I know I'm holding you back from the bar. Any questions for the business? So, what does it cost to bring a new mine? And that's one of the things that, you know, in the space business, we talk about big numbers. But I've looked at some of the mining stuff and talked to some mining people. Aren't you guys dealing with prodigious costs to bring yeah, 10 time scales to bring a new mine online? Yeah, it would be about 10 years. For a big operation in Northern Ontario, it would be 10 years from start to finish. And it would be at least a billion dollars. Maybe for a smaller one, half a billion, but certainly for the big uh, block caves, be a billion dollars. Yes, no question. No question about that. Um, I've been, uh, how do I put this? I guess I've been sort of involved in taking space technology into the mines for 10 years, sort of, and I have clients who are working at NAR, at least I'm helping clients in Central Europe. Yep. It's almost universally like. Robotic load hauls up for yeah, sure. Zen 3D scanning and using you know space yeah. technology. So those things, yeah. Nothing you just described takes that. Are you, are, you, are you suggesting that, that that's not the important stuff? Is it? No, it's, it's not that it's not important stuff. It's that we can't use the load haul dump stuff any longer. That's, that's just gone. Then. Well, it's not gone, but it's killing us. It's like cigarettes. I, I've never smoked in my life, but it's kind of like cigarettes. We're hooked on front end loaders and trucks. A 35 ton truck, which is what we have down there. We'll carry, carry 35 tons. That's 50 50. And it comes back empty. A front, front end loader, a scoop ram as we call them, carries 10 tons and it weighs 30. That means that 85% of the diesel you burn is <laughs> to move the machine. And 15% of the diesel is to move the ore. I think 8,000 people will suffer. We need to be in the ore moving business and not in the machine moving business. But that's a big transition to make for people whose entire careers have been based on this kind of technology. It means continuous systems, 
<coughs> not completely convenient assistance because we're always looking out the door of blast. There's been several efforts to bring in cutting technology, tunnel boring technology. Our rock is 200 to 250 megapascals strong. There's no cutting technology that will do that for us. And please don't make lasers. Or what's the other one? The, there's another kind of technology. Anyway, it's all crazy stuff. Because explosives is the single most inexpensive way to break rock by orders of magnitude. Remember, nobody's down there doing this for fun. We're only down there to make money. If we're not making money, we're not down there. That's done. The cheapest way by orders of magnitude to break rock is with packaged explosives as they exist today. So fancy dancy isn't going to do it for us. But we do have to make our processes as continuous as process, as continuous as, po as, po as possible. So one of the things, of course, is because it's mostly a male environment, and this is a huge problem for us as well, bigger is always better. Actually, you know, girls, it's not, but we think it is. Right? So that's not actually true. That's why we drive to do bigger and bigger blasts. We actually need to go back and do smaller bites of journey all the time and make it quasi continuous. It will never be continuous with our rock friends. But we can make it quasi continuous so that we can move it into a much more simple and productive system. But that is a huge transition for the current population. Fortunately for me, the current population has, will have no truck whatsoever with helmets and suits. Because they're all tough guys, they've been doing it for 30 years, and they are fine, thank you. Of course, until they fall over with a heart attack. Our advantage is, however, that we have to have a complete transition of the work to 22 year olds or 20 year olds. And they will want the new technology. So, what we are aiming to do with the technology as we bring it in is to give it only to the younger people to use. And eventually, about three to four years from now, the older guys that were are left will start to complain that they didn't get any of that stuff. How come we didn't get that? And that's the transition. There's no point in us trying to force that new stuff on 30 year veterans. Underground mining guys. It's not going to work. So there's a technological transition that has to take place, and we're matching it with a demographic transition that must also take place. Anybody else? <laughs>